That's what we lose during the period of the response. Now, a lot of his work then went into trying to argue that, in fact, he was dealing with a baseline activity. I don't want to get into that. What I want to focus on is uh, the idea that, uh, that there was some kind of functionality that was ongoing, um, sustained as a contrast to transiently activated, that is, probed, uh, probed by a stimulus, in the resting brain, attenuated when resources were temporarily reallocated elsewhere. Um, well, when, uh, already when Reiko was doing this work, uh, a different way of looking at, at, at an fMRI had been developing with this wall's work at, at Wisconsin. Um, most of the time, people haven't looked at the dynamics of the fMRI response, particularly because it's, it's a sluggish kind of response. But what uh, this wall did is uh, uh, obtain bold signals every 250 milliseconds. And what he found, now he was in an active paradigm. The person was moving a hand. But what he found were synchronized oscillations, very slow, 10 seconds or more, across uh, uh, motor areas. And what he began to think about is if we've got synchronized activity, those areas that are, being synchro that are showing synchronized activity might actually form a network. And so the approach has now been called functional connectivity fMRI as opposed to just functional um, MRI. And what Mauritius and his collaborators did was apply the approach to the areas that Reiko had characterized as the, uh, the default network, the areas that were deactivated <coughs> in most tax situations. And in fact, here what we're looking at is looking at the activity uh, in the uh, posterior cingulate uh, and in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and, and what they're finding, you know, notice we've got, these are very slow oscillations, uh, 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 but we do find synchronized oscillations in the, in the, in the fMRI signal in the, uh, across these areas, and that's just two of the areas. You can do it over many more of the areas that were <coughs> constituted that network. Um, so the idea began, began to be, well, there may be this network of brain areas that's endogenously active. But it turns out not just those areas are active in the resting state uh, 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 condition, but other network, other sets of areas also show synchronized activity, but now synchronized with themselves, not with the default network. Uh, initially, uh, uh, Reiko et al. were comparing a uh, network active during attention tasks with the resting state area. In the attention task, they found uh, activity in places like the interparietal softness, frontal eye fields. And the idea was, or the result was, these areas also show synchrony, but out of phase with, the, uh, with those, in the, those areas in the resting network. Uh, more recently, Mantini et al. had identified uh, six different networks, which each of which maintains os uh, coordinated oscillations within themselves, but uh, uh, where they are either at different phases or at uh, different periods from, from, the up from each other. Um, and as Rainbow has put it, a consistent finding is that regions with similar functionality, now we're looking at areas which would be activated in a given task or deactivated, those regions are, uh, tend to be correlated in their spontaneous bold activity. The point here is, not, is we're looking at some of the same kinds of things that's been looked at in traditional MR, where we're just looking at responses, but now looking at it as evidence of the kind of coordinated network that's, a, that's active in the brain. Um, and um, active not when a task is presented, but as part of the brain being uh, just uh, uh, an, an ongoing active system. Uh, uh, now, in fact, you might say, well, OK, but maybe this is just irrelevant to anything cognitive. Well, it turns out it isn't. Uh, that if one looks at uh, uh, how people respond to stimuli, uh, we already had evidence that the variability in bold response uh, corresponded to behavioral responses. What uh, uh, Rainbow's group then did was took advantage of a situation in which they're, they're having a person uh, do a button press with one with the finger on one hand, and they're comparing the uh, patterns in the, two, uh, in the two hemispheres during this period. And what they found was that, uh, okay, so the, the person's performing the button press with the right hand. Uh, this is uh, showing a spike in, in activity during the time of doing the button press. 
But what, was, what they were noting is that there is this huge variability uh, and in the resting state, or, in the, or if you look at it in the, in the right hemisphere, uh, you can now compare that variability with the variability found in the response pattern at the point of stimulus. And actually, when you do that, most of the variation turns out to be likely to be the endogenous activity that's, uh, that's being noted here in the other hemisphere. Uh, 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 what they then went on in a subsequent study to do is, uh, is ask, does it in fact correlate with something about the behavioral response? And in fact, it correlated very well uh, with the actual force with which the subject pressed the button. The subject was allowed to press the button with any force they wanted. How strongly they pressed the button depended upon the endogenous, period, uh, uh, on, uh, the endogenous activity going on in the background. Uh, and, uh, you could show that that uh, was actually due to the, uh, that the button press was actually due to uh, the endogenous activity. If you commanded them about the, uh, uh, how they would press the button, you lost that correlation. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I, I briefly noted that uh, one can find evidence of endogenous activity uh, through single cell recording and EEG. Uh, but one thing that's noteworthy is that these uh, oscillations that are found in those in those uh, signals are typically faster faster oscillations, uh, uh, one to 80 hertz or so, uh, whereas those found in the uh, uh, resting state MR are more like 10 seconds. Uh, the question is, well, are these just different things going on endogenously? Uh, Mantini's work, which I um, noted a moment ago, actually also found evidence that there's a high correlation between oscillations at different frequencies in, in the brain. Uh, particularly the, the activity that he found in the default network actually shows a high degree of correlation with, with uh, alpha band oscillations, whereas the attention network shows uh, a negative correlation with that. So EEG uh, 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 oscillations and the slower oscillations uh, in the default network seem to be correlated with one another. And there is a relationship between um, uh, frequency of oscillation and amplitude of oscillation it, that's such as to suggest that, in fact, the slow, amplitude, the slow frequency oscillations may be regulators within the system. Uh, and they also tend to be, uh, the oscillations tend to be synchronized over broader areas of the brain. They may be a powerful means for coupling and coordinating activity across the brain networks. Uh, now, those who have been involved, actively involved in identifying these networks have often been in, uh, 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 wanting to inquire, what do they reflect? What kind of cognitive activity are, is being reflected in an endogenous activity? There's an old literature in psychology on a phenomenon called mind wandering, which of course you're all familiar with because some of you are doing it now. Um, and everybody do, does know that if you're just sitting and nothing else to do, you will think of a variety of, of, of different topics. And uh, what uh, Randy Buckner has proposed is that activity in the default network may actually correspond to this kind of mind wandering. Because remember, a person sitting in the scanner, they're not told, shove off your brain. They're told, just sit there and, and uh, stay awake. Uh, and one cue that this might be a reasonable assumption uh, is that the areas, the one kind of task that does not reduce activity in the default network tends to be episodic memory tasks. So Buckner has been pushing the idea that maybe Ongoing episodic memory is the sort of default condition of the brain. Uh, we're constantly thinking of our past, planning for the future, using, uh, uh, using uh, resources that are involved in episodic memory. It's an interesting story. I don't, I don't think it's um, that what I'm going to say now definitely rules it out. But there's something a little bit uh, <coughs> complexing about that, and that is you find these same endogenous activities even in sleep and under anesthesia. Uh, so if it's the kind of conscious thinking that Buckner has in mind, uh, that doesn't seem to fit well with, with uh, uh, the perseverance of these endogenous patterns uh, in these conditions. Rako's proposed something a little different, that in fact what's going on is 
stop sharing an information problem.